I have a different approach to internet protocol design. Most people try and make their standards proposals as small and as simple as they can. What I try to do is to minimize the cost per function. So if I can provide twice the amount of functionality for 20% extra mechanism, I'll do that. And in the case of the mesh, I've discovered that adding a very, very small increment in complexity allowed me to provide an optional feature that's very powerful and allows us to do something that many businesses spend millions of dollars a year acquiring and managing. And in this presentation, I'm going to be telling you about that. Hello, I'm Philip Ann Baker, and in this presentation, I'm talking about the Mesh Confirmation Protocol. Now, you're probably familiar with second factor authentication, and second factor authentication is really useful. And second factor means, well, authentication factors are something you know, something you carry, something you are. So we like to combine a biometric with something you know, or something you know with a device. Relying on just something you know, just a password, is very error prone. A password in a device is much stronger. OK, so second factor is really useful in principle. The practice is a bit more complicated. And the problem here is we get back to affordances. There are almost no uh, keyboards that appear these days that have a slot for putting the smart card in. Um, you know, back in the 1990s, Bank of America thought that, you know, that they were coming along, and no, they didn't. And USB key fobs, uh, which seemed like a really good thing, well, those haven't really caught on either. You know, company had a really spurious patent and really destroyed the market there, but they're not all that convenient either because if I've got to carry around a different key for each one of my websites, that's a lot of keys. So the two mechanisms that we've come down to, well actually the one mechanism, uh, you have a device that produces a number. And this number changes every 60 seconds, or when you press a button, or it only appears on your phone when you get the SMS message. And it allegedly provides you with security or some sort of authentication. And really, it doesn't, especially with the SMS version. The SMS version, well, who told you SMS was... Uh, Secure? No. The telephone system's not secure. It's built with 1960s technology. Do you think Marbell had public key cryptography when they were designing that system? No. There's no security in the telephone system. And, you know, SMS? Oh, that can be spoofed. So, we come down to these, device, these tokens that have a changing value. And they do provide some security, but here's the big problem. They're all vulnerable to a man in the middle of attack. So we have Alice here, and Alice enters her one-time password token value into a website. OK. But all that we know is that Alice entered that number into something. We don't know that she entered it into the right website. If this is Mallet website, we're hosed. So when you get down to it, these changing number systems really aren't telling us what we need to know, which is not, did Alice enter a number into some website somewhere? What we really need to know is, did Alice authorize a particular transaction? Did Alice 
authorize the purchase of 200 Apple shares? Did Alice authorize the transfer of $10,000 to the Nigerian prince? Those are the things that we want to know about. And we can provide the that capability because you know we're all carrying these smartphones that are supercomputers with a display and a keyboard and an always on internet connectivity so we should be using that for authentication and not some device some number that what the heck does it mean anyway so how do we go uh, how do we get there well, the mesh confirmation protocol is just a thin layer on top of mess messaging. So if Alice wants to send a confirmation message to Bob, um, what happens here? Oh. So if Alice wants to send a message over to Bob, well, Alice, first of all, sends a confirmation message to her mesh service. Goes via the usual four corner protocol. And Bob downloads this message with it when he, he synchronizes his uh, device. And then if this request, this message has a statement, do you want to buy the 200 shares? Do you want to open the pod bay doors? And it is, you know, an English or whatever language, you know, French, whatever. It's in Alice, it's in Bob's own language. And it asks the question, does Bob actually want to do this? And if Bob says yes, his device sends back a signed uh, statement. Yes, Bob agreed to this particular thing. So we've got complete binding of Alice's request to Bob's response. And of course, we've got the usual mess messaging uh, access control to prevent abuse. And in this particular case, if we're going to have a request from Alice's bank, you know, if Alice is doing this on behalf of the bank, then we should see the logo of the bank appear on Bob's watch or his phone or whatever before he responds to the message. And this is where I want to make use of the PKIX logo type uh, specification. It's already been defined in IETF space. We had a proposal to do the legal and practices works to authenticate brands. Uh, there's a WIPO treaty called the Madrid Protocol. And there's a big database of every trademark in every country that uh, is part of WIPO, uh, which is the UN uh, Information Intellectual Property uh, Agency. So, so we've got a way of ensuring that Bob's, you know, when Bob is seeing this, he, he knows that it's coming from the bank, and then he signs it or he doesn't, goes back. And we can even tie the response to the particular device that Bob is using, which could be very useful if we're applying this inside an enterprise. You know, if the network administrators were using this for adding or removing uh, users from the system, we can they can now tell that, ah, this uh, mallet was uh, his, his request to get an account. That was accepted from that device that was stolen three months ago. Uh, oh, and here are all the other suspicious transactions that happened on that device. And at the very least, we can see what those were and maybe go back and unwind some of them. So the confirmation protocol is a really simple, compact piece of code that just layers upon all the capabilities that we already needed to create to make the mesh. Uh, and generalizing them. Because really what we've got here, when Alice is joining a device to her profile, she's got to say yes or no. When Bob receives a contact request from Alice, she, he has to say yes or no. So 
generalizing that to any sort of contact request, it only makes sense. And so for a very small increase in complexity, we get a second factor authentication capability for free. And Alice and Bob can use it on their existing smartphones and it's easier to use than remembering these silly numbers. And that's it. So please like and please subscribe. And in the next presentation, I'm going to show you how mesh group encryption works and how we can actually use mesh group encryption to make better use of the password encryption capabilities already provided in Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and all those business applications that you're already using. So stay along for that and like and subscribe. Thank you.